My name is Chris Riley. I'm a committee member of the Training, Learning, and Leadership Committee, and we have many other of our members in the audience today. Whether you're here in person with us or you're watching us on the video recording, we're glad to have you with us for this remarkable speaker and educator. The Training, Learning, and Leadership Committee is pleased to present Dr. Julie Hogan today. Dr. Hogan is an associate professor at the University of Nevada, Reno's College of Business. She earned her doctoral degree at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas in sociology. She earned her master's degree at the University of California, Chico. She spent 30 years in the substance abuse prevention field and has amassed a whopping $38 million in grants and contracts and has three textbook publications. For 30 years, Dr. Hogan has deeply engaged in the topic of culture. Over the past 10 years, she's been embracing diversity through the framework of cultural humility. In August of 2015, she met a student who changed her life. After experiencing some socially rich observations in the classroom, Dr. Hogan accepted a gift that changed the way she views American culture and herself. Please help me welcome Dr. Julie Hogan. Really study me. When you see me in this room, who do you think I am? Why do you think that? And what does this say about you? I'm guessing that several concepts may have occurred to you as I walked around this room. Let me play with a few of the ideas that I've heard while wearing this robe, while I've talked to others like you. Muslim, woman, uneducated, oppressed, quiet, terrorist, scary, ISIS, sexual, foreigner, non-English speaker. Savor these for a moment while I tell you a tale, a story really, a tale of two robes. This tale will illustrate the difference between cultural competence and cultural humility. It was about three years ago today that I walked into a university classroom at the College of Business at the University of Nevada, Reno. With textbooks in hand and syllabi, I walked into the room and was immediately greeted with a woman dressed exactly as I'm dressed today, sitting front and center in the classroom. Lining the perimeter of the classroom walls was every other student. Interesting, I thought. Who is this exotic being? And what is it about her that's brought her here why does she wear the burqa and hijab? And why are all the other students socially distancing themselves from her while still remaining in the classroom? This observation began my deep dive in cultural humility. During the course of the semester, I teach a course in executive gaming management so it's all about leadership and what it takes to run gigantic gaming industry casinos and manufacturing facilities. During the course of the semester, I noticed that the students weren't engaging the woman who came dressed like I'm dressed today. There were class assignments, group work, even a visit to a casino where the assignment was to collect experiences in a, in a gaming facility. They were to look at the games, they were to look at the leadership, they were to look at how the slot banks were managed, they were to look at how patrons engaged and communicated with employees. The student, as some students do, during the course of the semester, began coming to visit professors. This student 
became regularly coming during my office hours and said to me, I can't go to the casino. Is there a chance you could maybe give me another assignment? And I said, you can't go to a casino. Why can't you go to a casino? And she said, I've been seriously threatened and scared for my life in casinos in Reno. And I said, what? She goes, yeah. I said, tell me more. Help me understand this. I said, is it employees that have threatened you? Is it patrons that have threatened you? I mean, where, where are you? She goes, it, it's the guests. I've been very scared and I've had to leave casinos. It's been horrible for me. Can I please have an alternative assignment? I said, absolutely. Gave her an alternative assignment, no problem. Also during the course of the semester, there were group projects that were happening in the classroom. The other students refused to work with her. She came in my office, she said, I don't know what to do. The other students won't work with me. I said, seriously, they won't work with you? She said, no, they won't work with me. So I had to go to the class, I tried to get everybody working together, gave them numbers, everybody had to work together regardless of whether they liked it or not, in a respectful way to get the assignments done. So certainly as the student continued to come into my office, as often happens, professors start learning more about students as they learn more about us. So we talk about class assignments, we talk about study habits, we talk about things that will help them be successful in your class. And this student eventually over time started telling me a tale about who she was and how she got here and why she chose to continue to wear the robes of Islam in American society. I found out she was from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. In that country, this kind of dress for women is very normative. It's not at all unusual to see somebody dressed like I'm seeing today. It's the primary way that people present themselves in public, women do. I found out she had lived in the state of Texas before coming to our beloved Silver State. And uh, from the moment she stepped off the plane here, she collected experiences that were far more severe than the experiences she had even had in Texas. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. It's very interesting. I love Reno. I love Washoe County, and I'm sure you do too. And I was very surprised to hear this, because this is not something you would normally hear if you were reading literature in a way that we generally digest um, information on other cultures, or if you were watching a special on TV, you wouldn't hear this particular perspective. So I became very, very interested. As a professor at the university, I often will lecture to my students in these robes. They don't recognize who I am, and I'm treated much differently when I lecture to them. There have been experiences where I've talked about cultural humility, shared my experiences, came in. Even through the course of the semester, they did not recognize who I was. And when I went to embrace them in the way I've been taught, which women will shake other women's hands, but in Saudi Arabia culture, women do not touch men and men do not touch women. The only person you would touch of an opposite sex would be your husband or your brother. So when I went to greet them individually in the classroom and extended my hand to the women, but retracted my hand to the men, it caused social dis-ease, unrest, anxiety. Some of my female students refused to even shake my hand. Interesting, I thought, very interesting. Once the semester was over, I had the student in my office and I said, well, now that the professorial student relationship has truncated, would you be interested in an outing? Can I buy you lunch? Would you be willing to be a mentor and teach me what it's like in my own American culture to be you? Do you have some robes that I could borrow? And might we go out for lunch? She said, that would be great. I was thrilled. I remember the day clearly. I got in my car and I decided to drive over to her house. I'd never been there before. 
and I was full of anticipation and excitement. And I got out and she greeted me and we began to talk and he was wonderful. And I thought before I had the robes put on the first time that they would be a very heavy, burdensome feeling. I thought they would be heavy. I thought I would feel oppressed. I thought I wouldn't be who I really am. But I was surprised that once I had on these beautiful robes, which are actually very lightweight, I felt just like myself. And I can actually see better, believe it or not, because the black kind of stops the refraction from happening on my glasses. <laughs> so I can see really well. And I was amazed at how comfortable the robes were. And I didn't feel like anything except myself in another outfit. We got in the car, she dressed me, I drove, we decided to go to the mall because she told me this is a safe place for us to be. So I thought, terrific, safe place, sounds good. When we got out of that car, everything changed. Everything changed. Suddenly I realized that everybody was looking at us. That's not something I'm normally used to having happen. And as we walked into the restaurant, more and more eyes were feasting upon us. And as we walked in, it was like the whole crowd right before the hostess desk, everybody just parted. Almost like Moses parted the Red Sea. It was that dramatic. And eyes were either on us, on the floor, or there were whispers going around. And it became the most socially kind of stressful experience I'd ever had. We went up to the hostess, we asked for a table or two. We went to the back to wait in one of the most extraordinarily uncomfortable social situations of my life. When the hostess finally called us, and I think it was maybe five or 10 minutes, but I can guarantee it felt like an hour, we were seated. The next experience that happened is the, ho the uh, server came up to give us water. And what I noticed immediately is she was shaking like this as she put the water down. Immediately I felt I owed her an explanation. So I said, hey, there's nothing that's gonna happen to you bad here. This is my student, I'm a professor. We're just here conducting a social experiment. I wanted to learn what it's like to walk in the robes that she walks in in our own culture. Everything's gonna be okay. And she said, why did you trick me like that? And tears started running down her face. Interesting, I thought. That's something that wouldn't happen to me normally. We ordered our food, and the next thing that I had to learn from my mentor and friend and former student was how to eat with all of this on, okay? She taught me the, a little technique. She said, well, first of all, with glasses of drink, you order a straw, because it's really a lot easier, and it is. You just do kind of this swoop method like this, and you're able to put food in with forks and normal utensils, <laughs> and you're able to drink with no problem at all. So as she was continuing to mentor me about how to eat without spilling everything all over the front of me, which is, you know, was, was a challenge, I started noticing the dynamics in the restaurant around us. This restaurant on this particular Saturday around noontime was completely packed, but there was one empty table and it happened to be the table right next to us. During the course of that lunch, three pairs of white, seemingly middle-class women refused the only open table next to us. Interesting, I thought. They won't even sit by us. Towards the end of our meal, two young college age looking people showed up and they did take the chair next to us and I began talking to them and asked them how they felt when they realized they could have a table but it was next to us. Was that discomforting to them? And they said, no, 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 it was fine. We had no problem with it at all and we're really hungry and that line over there is really long. <laughs> so it ended up turning out all right. But one of the things that I began learning right away is boy, this is complicated stuff. This is not something I would normally read about or know about or understand. And that's the magic of cultural humility. You engage a mentor who's able to teach you what it's like 
even in your own culture, to live the way they live. After we had lunch, we went into the restroom, readjusted our robes, because it's culturally appropriate to show your face to other women in Muslim culture. So in the restroom, that was safe space. We took things off, rearranged, got everything going. We decided we were gonna take a stroll in the mall. I was excited, but a little bit nervous because obviously I had already collected some social experiences that were surprising and kind of anxiety provoking. When we walked out in the mall, there were a number of experiences that happened to us. So if you can visualize, there's two of us dressed just like this. We're walking hand in glove, you know, just walking down the mall, looking at stores, just like anybody I would normally do when I go shopping at the mall. Uh, the first experience happened, a mother had two children, one in a stroller and probably a two to three year old, who saw us, stepped back, screamed bloody murder, ninja! and then ran back to his mother's loving arms. I looked at my friend and I said, well, that was an interesting experience. I haven't, can't say I've ever had that happen before. Has that happened to you all the time? She said, all the time. I was to be all the time. They always think I'm a ninja fighter. As we continued, um, continued uh, walking, I noticed that most people avoided eye contact. Once they would see us, they would look down, look away, whisper to each other. But there wasn't anything really quite alarming about that. I'd seen that before, so you know, I thought, okay, that's probably the, the standard way most people would greet us. At one point, though, we came across a group of five people that were you know, kind of talking with one another, and they stopped, they saw us, they all turned toward us, pivoted, and balled up their fists. I mean, I was really scared at that point. And I thought, man, could this gown evoke a bullet? I became aware, really, for the first time of my own personal safety and security needs. And I wasn't sure I really had them. I knew them all had security, but I didn't see any of them around. Well, we quickly walked in the other direction. I asked my mentor, wow, that was, oh boy, that was interesting. <laughs> you know, what was that? She's like, well, this happens to me sometimes. Groups of people are very agitated and they act like they want to beat me up. And I'm like, well, how do you deal with that, that kind of uh, that energy, that social energy? She goes, well, I just walk in the other way and try to get out of there as quick as I can. She goes, but if that happens to me a lot, I don't go back to that place anymore. And I think that's the kind of thing that happened to her in casinos, where people were, were that shaken up that they were ready to take her down. But I really think that in, um, in a lot of my experiences, probably the biggest surprise and the most deeply distressing thing that happens is occasionally when I walk in Reno wearing these robes, I will come across a man, a single man, and I get the most lurid sexual gaze I have ever observed in my life. And when that first happened to me, I was with her and I said to her, my God, what the hell was that? Because you see, my mentor is really good at interpreting gazes. It's kind of funny, you know, because you mostly see my eyes here. And what happens is you start observing the way people are looking at you. So I needed her to interpret what that meant. And she said, well, I, I think they're fantasizing about us. I don't know why, but I get this look every now and again. Wow, fantasizing. I never would have guessed that. Again, another lesson that I wouldn't have learned had I not engaged a mentor through the process of cultural humility. Another social experience, uh, experiment I decided to conduct, and this was uh, at a time uh, after a major election, and there was a lot of uh, talk about uh, immigration and vetting, extreme vetting at airports. I had a flight uh, from Reno Tahoe International Airport down to Dallas, Texas. I was attending a conference on race and ethnicity in higher education, and I decided, you know, 
I haven't really had an airport experience. An airport TSA experience I think might be pretty interesting about this time. So I decided that I was gonna fly down to Dallas, Texas dressed like this. When I checked in the airlines, uh, the woman who was checking me in and taking my bag was very disheveled and actually forgot to even ask for my ID, which is a standard TSA protocol. Didn't happen. I thought, huh, that's pretty interesting. Always happened to me every other time. I guess this get up got her out of her main mode of asking for identification. Either way, I got my ticket, I checked my bag, and I started headed towards TSA. Now, before I went to the airport, uh, I went ahead and put my U.S. passport into my bag because I thought, you know, maybe my driver's license won't be enough. I'm not really sure what's going to happen, but I want to make sure that I can actually get on my flight. So I had all that in my bag. And as I walked with my, my bag and, you know, this outfit on, I went through and... Uh, was in line and I noticed everybody was pretty nervous and they were noticing me. And I thought, okay, well, this is kind of what I expected. And then I suddenly across the room, a TSA representative saw, saw me and came straight at me. It was probably this far from my face, said, where are you going, ma'am? I said, uh, Dallas, Texas. <laughs> uh, what are you doing there? I said, well, I'm actually attending a conference on race and ethnicity. What are you doing here in Reno? Well, I live here. You live here? How long have you been living here? Well, about 20 years. Okay, ma'am, I hope you have a good flight. Great. Got through that one. I was shaking by this time. So at that point, I found my passport right away, and I just thought, I'm not even going to mess with the Nevada State driver's license. I'm going straight for the passport. Because <laughs> I wasn't sure what was going to happen by the time I got to the actual screening desk. So I walk up to the screening desk. Again, all the people are visibly noticing everything and seem uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable. The whole kind of social area is teeming with, it, with a lot of energy. I get up to him. He hand him my U.S. passport. He looks at me and says, so ma'am, I'm going to have to ask you to remove your veil because I need to see, according to TSA regulations, if your face actually matches up with the image here on this passport. Now, I have a special room that I can take you in. At this point, I'm thinking, no way. There's no way I'm going into a secret room. <laughs> There's no way I'm doing that. I said, no, sir, that would be just fine. I would be happy to show you my face. I lift my veil. He does the check. He says, fantastic. Have a great flight. Hey, awesome. I was impressed. If that was extreme vetting, hey, I passed. I was happy and proud of my culture. When I went through the rest of it, normally, you know, when you're in TSA, you have to take off all your layers. There's a lot of layers here. But they exempted me. I didn't have to take any layers off. I did slip off my shoes. But I walked right through the machine. Everything was fine. But the one thing that happened that's never happened to me before is that they checked, hand-checked my head. But that was it. And I was happy to have them check it. They didn't make me remove my veils. I made it through clean. I was ready to go. While I was in the airport, of course, as life would have it, have it, my airplane had a major mechanical error. So I had the blessing of spending six and a half hours in the Reno Tahoe International Airport. And I thought, well, maybe this is a gift. I'm just going to walk around. I mean, this has got to be the safest social space, right? Because I've already screened for every weapon that could ever happen, you know, from water to belts to whatever else. There was no way that I was going to get hurt. So I figured this would be a great, this would be great. So I spent that time walking around the different gates out on the other side of TSA, and I started collecting all kinds of experiences. And I noticed that when I would sit next to a person, they were uncomfortable. Sometimes, they would get up and leave. Other times, I would try to talk to them because I tend to be kind of social and extroverted with strangers. And I could see that they were really studying me. They were trying to figure out who I was. And as I spoke, I could see that they were becoming less agitated and more kind of comfortable. And I would talk to them a little bit about what I was doing and ask them about their feelings when I first sat down. 
So it was a good learning opportunity, and it was a great opportunity to just randomly talk to various people to figure out what they thought about what they saw. And I learned a lot more about Reno. I learned more about the culture that I'm a part of. And I would have never learned that particular, those particular stories and pieces of knowledge had I not been in the robes of Islam. Again, cultural humility presents us as learners in a respectful way where we engage people and we talk and we learn and we educate ourselves and others educate us, we can educate them a little about what it means to be us. The history of this robe actually goes back millennia. My mentor has told me that the veils and the burqa are worn in an act of pious modesty toward God. The robe that you see me in today was a gift, one of the most, if not the most significant gifts of my lifetime. It was given to me by my student uh, from Saudi Arabia out of love and respect, and I wear it with the honor and respect that it deserves. The robe itself is very lightweight, but the burden socially in American culture is extremely heavy. The women, by the way, who I've met who wear robes like this are confident, intelligent, goal-oriented, educated, powerful, engaging, and funny. Now, I bet I know what you're thinking now. My hair looks like shit. <laughs> so look at me again. Study me in this robe. Now, when you see me in this robe, I'm guessing several ideas may have occurred to you. First of all, I'm white. I'm a woman. I'm blonde. I'm obviously a doctor, a professor. I'm educated. I'm employed. I'm determined. And American. I earned this robe back in 1997. I actually graduated with my doctorate degree in sociology from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. This robe indicates the colors of my graduating institution. It's called an academic regalia. This is a tam, it's velvet. Um, this uh, blue thing is called a hood. You can see the back there. That denotes that I have a PhD. Medical doctors have a different color. Um, educators, uh, different kinds of degrees have different colored hoods. This robe is one that when, I'm, when I wear it, I'm treated with a lot of respect. I usually wear this to academic um, commencement ceremonies or other types of academic gatherings. And generally, when people re, uh, meet me in this robe, they extend a hand to shake and to thank me for educating students at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Crowds part for me in this robe, too, but they part for me out of respect, not out of fear. The robe dates back to the 12th and 13th centuries, and it's thought that this robe was worn by religious clerics. It's heavy weight and somewhat hot. It's got velvet and wool, and you know, the three uh, colors here indicate the three degrees of bachelor's, master's, doctoral degree. Um, it's loaded with symbolism. 
Um, the clergy were thought to wear these and they're heavy because they worked in cold, dark buildings. So the, hef the hefty weight of the material keeps them warm. Historically, men wore these ro robes, but now more and more women are earning their doctoral degrees and wear them as well. This robe was one that um, I had to work very hard to earn. It wasn't a gift, it was something that I had, I had to earn. When I wear this robe, there really is no social burden. In fact, when I shifted the robe off, it was almost like I could see the audience lighten up. There was relief. It's a professor, okay? Somebody that works in our, you know, higher education environment to educate our new workers. And the, the feeling is completely different when I walk in this robe. Now, I will tell you that there are many people in the academy that wear these robes. And I talk to a lot of them every day. <laughs> and the characteristics of these people are confident, intelligent, goal-oriented, educated, powerful, engaging, and funny. I feel much cooler now. <laughs> They're pretty hot. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, reframing our perspectives. It's really important um, when we meet other people and when we think about ourselves to reframe a little bit about what we're seeing. We all make judgments when we meet people and we meet each other about who we are and who the other people are. But sometimes judgments, if they are inaccurate, can create misconceptions, inaccurate assumptions, and can lead to overall bad behavior. So I want to really challenge you in this talk to think about what you think you know about yourself and what you think you know about others. The first model I'd like to share with you is called the cultural iceberg. This is a common model to discuss um, cultural understanding that has been taught for many, many years. And in fact, when I used to do workshops on uh, training people about culture that I've done for over 30 years, I, I use this, um, this metaphor as a way of talking about the difference between deep and surface culture. So if you look at the image of the iceberg, you notice the stuff that you actually see above the waterline is pretty small. The bulk of the iceberg is underneath the water. So if you are navigating a ship uh, and you're trying to avoid hitting icebergs, you want to stay way, 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 way away from them because underneath this could be this massive ice. This metaphor is a very good metaphor to learn about the difference between surface and deep culture. Surface culture would be the tip of the iceberg. These are things that we see, know, understand, smell, feel, observe, touch about culture. So let me give you an example. Surface culture. Think about a culture that you identify with. We all have one, at least one. Okay, are you thinking that? All right, I want you to think about some of the things that maybe you do in your culture that are surface culture indicators. Food, okay? That's one you can see, taste, feel. Flags, festivals, things that you celebrate. Uh, fashion, what you wear. Burqa, a robe, a suit. Holidays, which holidays you celebrate, which ones you don't, and how you celebrate within those holidays. Music, what kind of music you listen to. Performances, dancing, that's a big one. A lot of times we learn things about culture through dance. Games, arts and crafts, literature, the books you read, the language you speak. These are all surface culture attributes. Now I want you to look at that model and we're going to talk about what's underneath the waterline, what we can't see when we're in our ship. And those are deep culture attributes. 
These are things like communication styles and rules, facial expressions, gestures, eye contact, personal space or proxemics, how close or far we sit from each other, stand, stand with each other, touching, do we touch, body language, our tone of voice, our emotional displays, are we comfortable feeling, expressing our emotions or not? Uh, our family values, our manners, pride, what we take pride in, our work ethic, our concept of justice, our self-concept, our thought patterns, our biases, our beliefs and assumptions, our aesthetics, things we find beautiful, our concept of cleanliness, our relation to authority, our attitude toward school, our core values, our beauty ideals, our approaches to health and medicine. So the key point here is that surface culture is what we see. Deep culture is really who we are. And when we make assumptions based on that little tip of the iceberg that we see, it only gets us so far. It gets us somewhere, but not really where we need to go if our goal is true understanding, honest dialogue, deep learning, and sincere respect. Competence. Cultural competence workshops are the current prevailing paradigm in American society. I've been involved in creating cultural competence workshops for over 30 years. I have a grant portfolio where I'm often asked to put together a curriculum. I've traveled the nation training other trainers to implement that curriculum so that people can understand how to really embrace respectfully with multiple cultures. All of these competent workshops had learning objectives, agendas, case studies, assessments, general information that is basically so general, I mean general, general information, it's like stereotypical. And at the very end, you fill out an assessment about, you know, Likert scale, if it you know, helped you or didn't help you, and you fill out the evaluation, yeah, I like this, no, I didn't like that. And then you're deemed culturally competent. You are now, you have a certificate that says, I attended workshop A, you stick it in your file, and when your employer asks you for proof that you had some kind of training, and I see you're smiling, you've been through these before. This is the current prevailing paradigm. This is the way in American society that we teach one another about culture. I've done it. I've taught it. I've been funded to teach it. I've taught others to teach it. I've also been a student in all kinds of cultural competence workshops throughout the entire course of my career. And I can tell you that both as a designer and instructor and evaluator and implementer and a student, this is a very white way of learning about culture and it's loaded with privilege. And frankly, it doesn't really get to the level that we need to get to if we're really to embrace other people in a culturally humble way. The whole word up there, competence, and I like that slide, when you think about it and you think about the culture that you identify with, I mean, do you feel competent in your culture? I mean, I certainly don't. I think it's kind of a weird word. And over the years of implementing these and critiquing them and thinking about it and really deep diving and writing about it and publishing it and everything else, I've just kind of decided I need to critique what I've been doing the last 30 years because unfortunately, I don't think it really cut it. And I didn't really know that in a profound interpersonal way until I was gifted the robes of Islam until I challenged myself to get out of my head of what it meant to be a woman from Saudi Arabia and into the Reno culture, my culture, in those robes, did I begin to really understand the many true gifts of compassion and understanding that are given to us with cultural humility. 
The next model I'd like to show you, which is really one that's based on cultural humility, is a metaphor when I went to Dallas, Texas, to the Race and Ethnicity Conference in my burqa and hijab. Um, this is called the Tapestry Model of Cultural Understanding. This is a newer approach to culture and really informs what we do with humility. Now, I want you to look at that slide. This slide, by the way, is the tapestry. It's a Muslim prayer cloth that my student gave me the same time she gave me the, uh, the burqa and hijab. Do you notice the threads there on the edge? Do you see those colors? I want you to look really hard at those colors. Each of those colors represent a culture that we belong to. You may be saying, well, what do you mean? There's actually all kinds of cultures that we belong to, whether we realize it or not. So we belong, of course, there's a race and ethnicity culture that we belong to and we identify with, but there are also other kinds of cultures. There's a culture of gender. You have a culture as county employees. I share a culture with you as public servants. Taxpayer dollars fund what we do. We are all educated, either through formal degrees or through experience or through both. We're all hardworking. We work. There's a culture of working for Washoe County. You also have hobbies. You have a life outside of your employment here. Those hobbies have culture associated with them as well. Your family may practice certain customs that have been handed down through the generations. Your family has a culture. If you're involved in fitness, there's usually cultural kind of practices around your fitness. We also go see doctors. We may be a doctor. There's medical culture. Food that we prepare, whether on a daily basis or for special celebrations, also exude culture. The idea here with the graphic is that each thread represents one of the cultures that we belong to. And all of us belong to multiple cultures. And then the cool thing about it is if you look really closely, there is no purple thread. There's no purple thread. Yet when woven together, they create beautiful purple flowers. This intersection of cultures to me, as a sociologist, is sociology, is socially very interesting. We call this cultural intertextuality. It's a blending of all of the components that make us uniquely us. So although we wear the many colors of the rainbow, of the beautiful parts of all of the cultures that we involved, are involved in, when woven together, they create something magical and new. Cultural humility, then, is really a lifelong journey in humbleness. We never become an expert at our culture or the culture of another, but we do become sensitive and compassionate to understanding in a more deeply and profound way the intersecting parts that other people have that we're involved with. It's definitely a richer, complex, and more meaningful way to learn about culture. It requires a mentor and a mentee. It offers an environment where we can ask questions like a child. You know, I have two girls, and when they were little babies, it was interesting to me the questions that they asked. Things that I already assumed had learned along the way, I never really thought about them not knowing that. They're little, they emerge. They would ask questions, Mama, what's this? How come this feels like that? No question is left unanswered. And the space between the mentor and the mentee in the journey of cultural humility is based in trust. So there is no stupid question. Because if you're not free to ask those questions, you can't learn what it means to be them. You also walk in the shoes of another, or in my case, I walked in the robes of another. You collect social experiences. You collect interpersonal experiences. You share stories in a way of seeking understanding. 
you also break bread. I think of the root word communication. The root of the word communication is commune. When we commune, we break bread. It's the way that we talk with one another. A lot of understanding around culture happens while eating food. It's just happened in my life. A lot of times when I've really tried to understand what it's like for another, we end out with a meal. And I did that with my experiences in the burqa and hijab as well. We also need to be free to have courageous conversations. When we receive things we can't interpret, like for me, I was very amazed at some of the gazes. I had to be free to ask, what the hell was that? And she had to be comfortable enough to tell me what she thought it was. And then I had to figure out for myself, why have we sexualized Muslim women? Why have we done that? Where did that come from? Right before we met today, we had a little conversation about that. And when I went to the conference in race and ethnicity, and I was asking that question and, and was really struggling with how did we sexualize Muslim women as Americans? How, what did we do? I began reflecting. And I reflected on movies. And then I reflected on a particular Disney character that was very popular a number of years ago that was dressed in a very sexually seductive outfit. And when I was at the, ra the conference on race and ethnicity, I also went to a booth where they had a portable Arab American um, set of images that were traveling across university campuses as a way of educating people about Arabs. And what I saw there were a lot of cartoons, caricatures of um, exaggerated features of Arab men with women in sexually seductive clothing, sexual harems. And suddenly then it occurred to me that I had something to go back to tell my Saudi Arabian friend about why I think those gazes may be attracting uh, people. Because she didn't understand it. She, di she didn't have the American imagery in her head. And I wasn't yet in touch with it enough to truly know what it was. Now, if I hadn't have been able to ask a courageous question about that and take the answer and dive deeper somehow and then go back and say, I think it could be this, does that make sense? And we talked about it and we think that's probably what it is. You know, if I wasn't free to do that and have those courageous conversations, I wouldn't understand that part of her experience here in my own culture. So through the, the path of cultural humility, I have found deep insights. It's taught me to be respectful, to be educational, to learn, to share. And it's truly been a very humble journey of compassion and definitely not a workshop of competent stereotypes. And what I will say about one of my big lessons that I've taken away from my journey in the robes of Islam is that I am so proud to be an American. I am proud to live in Reno. I love Washoe County. But you know, I really don't like the way we treat Muslim women. So who you see now before you in this suit with my blonde hair is who I really am. I'm a white, full-blooded American woman. I have ancestors from Germany, the Czech Republic, and Ireland. I'm a mother of two fantastic girls, age 14 and 18. I'm an author, I'm a speaker, a professor, a sociologist. I'm a Catholic, I love to scrapbook. I'm a scuba diver, I'm a friend, a mentee, mentor, leader, grant writer, sister, daughter, and I do it all as a single woman. So in my tale of two robes, I hope you have discovered that my robes may or may not tell you who I really am. More importantly, they may tell me who you are and determine how you behave toward me. Confident, engaging, powerful, and funny, Dr. Julie Hogan. Thank you, Dr. Hogan. 
We hope you enjoyed Dr. Hogan's presentation. The committee would like to appreciate the work of committee member Teddy Qualls, who coordinated Dr. Hogan's talk here today. We'd like you to look forward to two things coming from the Training, Learning, and Leadership Committee in early 2019, more Washoe Talks series, and also a book club with leadership as its premise. So we'll be sending out the book we'll be reading and hope you'll want to join us for those book clubs. We're happy you joined us for Washoe Talks session today and look forward to seeing you in the future. Have a wonderful long weekend. Thank you.